Hello from Prague. The following message is best viewed on an oscilloscope. Welcome to ICHEP 2020. Ha. Hello everyone. Welcome I'm Connie Potter. 2020. Hello everyone. I'm Connie Potter, co-producer of the Big Bang Stage and co-founder of the Big Bang Collective. Welcome to the biggest physics conference of the year and welcome to the very special program we've put together for you today and tomorrow, sharing the excitement, importance passion and fun of science. This is the fourth event on today's program and our next guest is a prize-winning innovator joining us live from California. Topher White has a background in physics and engineering. He came up with the idea of creating a simple device made of discarded cell phones and solar panels that detect and send alerts when it picks up the sound of chainsaws in protected rainforests. It really is the ultimate recycling using man-made items to save the planet. He has deservedly won multiple awards all over the world and will no doubt go on to win many more, and now has his own startup called Rainforest Connection, about which you can get more details on the Big Bang Stage webpage. We are very proud to have such an incredible innovator with us today, telling us more about the valuable work he and his team are doing every day. Hello, Topher, good morning. Thanks so much uh, for having me. It's, a, it's really wonderful to be here at a physics conference with physicists, no less. This is great. Thanks. Um, should I just sort of launch into a statement? All right, here we go. Let me dive right in and share. Up. So this is really great to be sitting here talking to you guys because uh, normally I just get to do storytelling um, from, from you know, these various places that we work around the world. But now I get to talk to some people who, who really would appreciate the technical side of this as well. Um, and so I'm just gonna sort of start telling you about the very first time that, uh, that I visited the rainforests. And so in uh, the summer of 2011, uh, I was living in France, not too far from CERN, but I, I visited the rainforest of Borneo uh, in Indonesia for the very first time to volunteer at a given reserve. Um, but it was, it was really this amazing, cacophony of noise that hit me the most, as you can sort of hear in the background. There's the, some noises that stick out though, like this is a hornbill, a very loud and noisy bird. And these are cicadas. And these are gibbons these amazing apes that just sing to each other from a great distance. So this place that we're listening to right now, the first place I visited was actually a gibbon reserve, a uh, place where they rehabilitate um, you know, gibbons in captivity to release them to the wild. Uh, and this is actually how they, they spend their time. But I didn't realize when I was there that even though they're putting the resources into this rehabilitation, uh, one of the biggest problems they have was uh, legal logging on the outskirts of this reserve. Um, and in fact, if you turn down the sounds of the forest, there actually has been a sound of chainsaws uh, in the distance, um, in the background the entire time. Um, and one day, uh, as part of this, uh, this program, walking off through uh, the forest, uh, stumbled upon um, just five minutes walk from the ranger, uh, ranger station, somebody was cutting down a tree. I uh, was there with the, sort of, um, the guy that ran this uh, NGO, and here he was uh, pretty broken because he was three, paying three full-time guards to, to guard this reserve, using a lot of resources on that. And they weren't even able to, uh, to hear or detect chainsaws. There were uh, just five minutes walk through the forest because it's so noisy and because it's really not feasible to, um, to monitor these places on foot. 
Uh, so looking at this from a certain standpoint, I figured, you know, I had to be able to build something that, uh, that would help them, or at least I wanted to. So this comes the idea of how do we actually stop uh, illegal logging in this area? Well, technology, which is what uh, the only thing I could really contribute to this, has a lot of different forms for, for doing this. Uh, we actually monitor uh, deforestation and logging on a, on a global scale. There's lots of technologies that go into it. There's, uh, there's as you can, there's satellites. Satellites are pretty amazing ways to see what's happening across the whole globe. They've really changed our understanding of environmental destruction and threats. Uh, there's camera traps, the ability to put cameras up there in the forest uh, and see what's happening when it goes through there. There's community monitoring phones. There's drones, because of course drones are, are everyone's solution to, to everything uh, to monitor the forest and just aerial surveys. So all these technologies are already actively in play for you know more than a decade uh, to be able to monitor the forest. But in this situation, they weren't able to help um, these people actually stopped the logging in the area because they weren't real time. And so uh, with that in mind, this is the solution that we sort of came up with. The very moment that a chainsaw goes off in the forest, the sound is picked up by a device up in the tree, which transmits an alert through the cloud to the rangers on the ground to get an alert on their phone. And they're like, what? And they jump on their motorcycles and they get out there and they stop the, rain, uh, the loggers there on the spot in this perfectly realistic rendition of exactly how it would happen uh, in, in the forest there. Um, so yeah, this is, this is the idea that I was sort of pitched. I sort of figured I would, I would build it for them. Um, at the end of the day though, uh, you do rely upon some device to go up in the forest uh, and do it. So what about old cell phones? Well, it turns out that phones, as you guys know, are pretty amazing little computers. Uh, they already have great software platform. They have to be powered with solar panels and you have to have a powerful microphone. And of course you have to protect them from the horrible conditions of the rainforest. Um, and so that's what this box and these solar panels are for. But beyond that, a phone can actually accomplish most of what you need. Uh, we live in this age, uh, and even a few years ago, where IoT is, we always think of it as this, um, it requires new hardware and new platforms. But it turns out that some of the best pieces of hardware that we have for IoT, uh, Internet of Things, might just be the ones we're throwing away. Um, so this is uh, an example of me um, putting it together in my parents' garage in Silicon Valley, which of course is a, uh, a natural, um, you know, you have to go through that anytime you build anything in the Silicon Valley is build it in your parents' garage. Uh, that's all come together. This is what it looks like up, up on a tree. Um, but then of course, I built something in San Francisco. Uh, that doesn't really show that you're able to make it work in the rainforest. So taking with that in mind, took it back to Indonesia uh, to another given reserve uh, run by the same organization on the island of Sumatra, put the device up in the trees. And on the second day we had it there, I actually picked up the sounds of chainsaws. So it was pretty nuts. You know, this guy climbs the tree, we head out there, he puts it up there, he comes back down, everyone's smoking their cigarettes and I get this alert on my phone. He says, there's a chainsaw in the distance, but no one had heard it. Uh, we quiet down and sure enough, you can hear this chainsaw, you know, several kilometers away. Um, and so we kind of take off running to go stop it um, and more or less arrive there on the scene. And, you know, this is, the moment where I'm, you know, I've been in the rainforest for like two days for the first time and not really sure what this is about, uh, regretting this whole endeavor, but he's moving. So I got to move, uh, kind of move along and get up over the hill to go try and stop these loggers. And sure enough, there they are. Um, so in this particular instance, this, uh, this group, these rangers in the area, as we call them, uh, were able to impress upon the loggers that uh, if they did come back, uh, they would be caught again. Um, and this, this is a small time, a small time case of logging, but even in this situation, they're able to use technology to get out there and stop it before too much damage was done and make a fairly large impression on the loggers. So based on this like initial test, the thought was like, oh man, this is going to be the type of thing we can take everywhere. Um, but just to back up for a second, this is how the whole system works. Uh, obviously we are not in a situation where like the, everyone's listening to these audio streams. It makes sense that they are, uh, in fact, of course, detecting these things automatically. Uh, the way these devices work, we call them guardians, is that they stream all of the audio up into the cloud over the cell phone network, which exists in these places. Um, in a lot of these places around the world, uh, even though they're pretty remote, there's no roads, there's no electricity, no running water, of course, but there is cell phone service. And everyone's been on their cell phones for well over a decade. The service exists on the outskirts of the forest. And that's the area, that's what we can use. So the, our system uh, actually streams this audio to the cloud where we pick it out. This initial implementation uh, was not using any sort of advanced techniques, just harmonic detection to pick up the sound of chain size as you can see. So these, these lines here are the harmonics. And you can tell that uh, picking out a chainsaw, even in this case, not too difficult. 
So saving the rainforest uh, is the type of thing that at least my generation, especially in the US, has heard about forever. We've been hearing about this for, uh, for decades. Um, while at the same time, uh, you know, we've been hearing the rainforest is about to disappear. Half the forest actually current remains ar around the world. Uh, and there might even be potentially, arguably, more pressing things for us to address, like climate change, uh, global warming, uh, and environmental loss. Um, but it turns out that uh, up to a fifth, potentially a fifth of all the de uh, decarbon emissions that take place on an annual scale actually uh, come from deforestation. That's more than all the transportation, all the cars, trucks, ships, planes, trains combined. All of that put together does not add up to the uh, annual emissions, carbon emissions from deforestation. Um, and of that, uh, of the logging that's taking place in the rainforest, up to 90%, 50 to 90%, according to Interpol, of all the logging taking place in the rainforest uh, is illegal, done by illegal loggers. Um, and so if you think about it, uh, that, you know, 50 to 90%, uh, that's a mandate. There's a mandate to stop illegal logging with local people, with local law enforcement, with local groups. Um, if there's a mandate to stop it, you could take a big chunk out of that. Now, of course, not all the deforestation that's taking place uh, is logging. A lot of it's from agricultural use, um, from burning, from other sorts of uses. But logging, illegal logging especially, is, uh, is such a profitable activity. Um, so much money can be made from you know, the extraction of the ex very expensive woods. And the companies will actually cut roads all the way into the forest just to take them out. And when they go in there, they're not taking out every tree. They're just taking out the most expensive, biggest trees, which of course does damage to the forest, but it's largely still intact. But to get those big expensive trees out, they will cut a road through the forest. And once a road is there on the ground, uh, that road then leads to other in in, um, incursions. People come in, they'll uh, set fires, smaller time logging, they'll, uh, they'll create farms. And so uh, a road can actually lead to the wholesale destruction of a forest just within a few years. But if you can stop the illegal logging, you can stop the roads. If you can stop the roads, you can stop the wholesale destruction of the forest. Um, and if uh, up to 90% of the logging in these areas is illegal, uh, just by cutting down on that, which is a mandate to do, you could take a very large chunk out of that 20%. It could be the fastest, cheapest way for all of us to fight climate change uh, today. Uh, and from a technological standpoint, one of these guardians up in the forest can actually have a pretty sizable impact if there's people there to do something with it. So you can hear chainsaws uh, up to a kilometer away. So that's about a three square kilometer radius or three square kilometer area, one kilometer radius. Um, the amount of carbon that's stored in that forest from avoided deforestation, 15,000 tons of CO2, that's equivalent to 3000 cars off the road for a year. Um, we're not responsible for these numbers. These are, this is just the amount of carbon that's in these old forests. And if you can keep them from being cut down, this is the impact that you can have um, with the right people there. And of course, many conditions as well. And you don't necessarily need to uh, you know, protect every square inch or every square meter of the forest. In many cases, you just need to put them on the periphery, on the outskirts, uh, where you can uh, catch logging or trucks or vehicles on the way in. Um, but of course, you do need local partners to do something with it. So that was just uh, this first initial foray into it. From there, uh, of course, we sort of told many people uh, about this technology uh, and they decided they wanted it. So our next project took us to Africa, to Central Africa, to Cameroon, um, to work with actually a local group um, of sustainable forestry um, professionals who were actually trying to keep this large concession from being uh, ravaged by uh, illegal logging and of course also um, poaching. So, that road that you just saw, those, uh, those lines there, actually represents uh, this, this sort of road out of this concession. Uh, and they were uh, expecting that um, most of the illegal poaching and logging was happening, coming out through this road. These were the guards that, uh, that actually guard that one gate. Everyone assumed that uh, they were corrupt and they were letting poachers through. You can see some of the endangered species there that they were um, sort of tasked with protecting. And yet still there was a large amount of illegal wildlife trade and illegal wood coming out of this area. Everyone assumed that these guys uh, were part of the problem. Uh, but we actually put up some of our devices along this road uh, about a few kilometers back. Um, and in the middle of, the, of this live streaming, this is what we began to hear. And so we trained the devices to listen, not just for chainsaws, but for vehicles as well. Uh, this is in the middle of the night around uh, 3 a.m. Uh, and you can actually hear a, a uh, motorcycle on its way out. So we were able to, uh, to track the locations and the timing uh, of the vehicle traffic on the way out figure out that uh, they had, um, they'd cut a, another trail off the road that was hidden uh, and they were able to make uh, quite a few busts from this. Uh, so that's a way in which we then adapted the system to not just look for chainsaws, but to look for vehicles as well. So beyond Africa, let's talk about the Amazon. Uh, so here's another project that's a, a rather large one uh, for us. So if you look at the Amazon, the largest rainforest in the world, um, 
what you see is this kind of like ocean deforestation, all this emptiness, and these islands of pretty intact forest. Um, so those are not actually necessarily traditional protected areas. They're not national parks. What they are is actually indigenous territories, um, tribal lands of, uh, of tribes that, uh, that are given the autonomy uh, to actually operate and protect their land. This area here is the Tembe tribe. Uh, it's pretty large. It's about 2,500 square kilometers. Um, and uh, that's about the size of a semi-national park for those in America. And uh, it's a pretty large area. Uh, this is the actual Tembe tribe uh, themselves. There's about 1,500 of them. Uh, in the tribe, which is, you know, a fairly small population. Um, and uh, this is the area they're trying to protect. When we actually uh, met them in 2014, uh, the entire purple area you see here was actually occupied um, and are annexed by illegal logging cartels, illegal drug cartels, and illegal settlers. So that even just driving from one town of the Tembe to the next, uh, you would actually run into full-on, full-scale, well-equipped trucks um, for loggers. The only thing they could really do in this situation was kind of keep driving as fast as they could and get out of there. Um, of course, it is a very dangerous operation to, to attempt to, to upset. So in, essentially, uh, they were getting pushed and boxed out of their land. And they recognized that you know, as part of their way of life, as well as the fact this land is theirs and they have nowhere to go, that uh, they really did need to sort of uh, rise up and protect themselves. So with that in mind, uh, the Tembe actually trained 30 young rangers. They equipped them. Uh, and uh, they took on the responsibility of both um, guarding the, the borders and pushing out what was a pretty large uh, amount of incursion into their land. Uh, all the Tembe are pretty much isolated down here in the south and up in the north, and they took it for 30, 30 guys uh, and women to be able to push out the rest of the rangers. Um, this is the size of that area. It's very, very large, um, but it turns out, as we talked about with other places, that there's actually cell phone service in the area. Um, there are cell phone towers on the outskirts, and it's not really uh, feasible for, for these 30 rangers to sort of get all over the place, but they can use a technology uh, somewhat like ours to be able to uh, detect uh, threats and chainsaws and, uh, and trucks in the area. But even the distance from this cell tower, these are cell towers, by the way, this cell tower to the border is a good 15, 18, 20 kilometers. That's pretty far, and it's near the limit of what uh, cell phone service um, can actually provide. So with that in mind, we... Uh, we began to and work with the Tembe themselves be kind of precise with this one here. to actually because build these devices uh, from old phones themselves. And sensitive. You want to put the microphone on there? Yeah, that's good. Old cell phones are available to almost anybody all the time. And these aren't trash. These are actually really, really powerful little computers. They can connect to the networks that are there. They can record the sound. They can do all this great processing. The hard parts, of course, have to do with making it possible to power them and making sure they can actually pick up sounds from a great distance. But all these are things that you can do with pretty standard electronics. Cool. Rock. Rock. Here we go. Got two. So in this case, um, you can see that this is Elibar. He's the one of the chief's sons. Uh, actually a pretty technically savvy guy uh, who can put together a device, maintain it, uh, and even more so, he can climb 50 meters up in a tree um, or more to be able to install this. You can pick up cell service and sunlight from a really great distance. Uh, so in this case, um, they were able to, uh, to install this and that's a long-term relationship that we have with the Tembe. Uh, this is one example of how a technology like this is actually pretty easy to understand for people, even though it does. Jaffer, I'm not sure I'm seeing anything on my screen right now. Oh, that's fine. This is uh, still just some blackness. Um, and so here's an, uh, an idea of how the system uh, works overall. Uh, again, the chainsaw goes off, you get an alert, uh, goes through the cloud, sends back to someone's phone, and they're able to show up and actually stop the loggers on the spot. Um, this is how it actually sort of comes in uh, to practice. Uh, so this is an actual chainsaw alert coming through our system. I guess I imagine you guys can sort of hear that chainsaw. Um, this is a little bit different than the first uh, chainsaw noise that you saw. These are the sort of uh, chainsaw detections. This is, of course, a convolutional neural network that we're using to, to train for it. But it, I imagine you guys can hear this chainsaw. That's not too impressive to be able to detect this chainsaw. This is a distance of maybe 300, 400 meters away. Um, but again, the Tembe territory is enormous and we can't put these things up everywhere. So they have to be able to pick up chainsaws at a great distance. And so in many ways, this is where artificial intelligence and the improvements that we've uh, been able to implement there make a huge difference. So in this case, we're able to pick up a chainsaw from well over uh, one and a half kilometers away. I'm not sure if you can hear that, but there it is. Very cool. So this of course then becomes a, a really important tool to be able to pick up uh, you know, 
danger, you know, threats and danger from a great distance and scramble uh, these rangers to, to the place where they need to be. In this particular case in the Cambia territory, um, of course, there was, there were chainsaws and trucks that were detected. Uh, the rangers were able to get out to a, uh, to a point where they could intercept them. We were able to get into location. This, of course, is a truck on the way out full of wood waiting at the end of the road. Um, you have a, uh, a member of the Tembe tribe uh, who were able to uh, seize, not just a member, actually there were quite a few, dozens of, of the, of the, uh, the rangers waiting there. They were able to seize the truck, seize the equipment, um, burn the equipment, burn the truck, uh, take, take the loggers into custody, and of course, uh, take full responsibility for uh, what's happening uh, on, their, on their land and in their territory. There is no law enforcement except for the Tembe in this area and most of the places. That's one of the things that's poorly understood is that uh, you can't get the police involved, you can't get the military involved because they just don't exist in these, in these areas. And it's entirely up to the uh, local communities and the tribes in some cases to actually take responsibility for it. In this case, uh, luckily, they're willing to. But that's kind of the point, right? Is that uh, I can build some technology in California, we can all be building uh, some tools and we can care about this a lot. But at the end of the day, it's these guys these guys, you can have the biggest possible impact. When you think about it, the amount of carbon impact that we looked at earlier, uh, 3,000 cars off the road for every three square kilometers. These people are just protecting their backyard. They're doing it for their own livelihood, for their own survival. But wow, I mean, if we want to have an impact on climate change in many ways, the most effective thing we can do is to build tools to help them do that. Um, in many ways, they can have this, this one guy here can have more impact on, on you know, fighting climate change than dozens of engineers in a clean tech company uh, or a self, you know, or electric car company. Uh, and they're even aware of that. Uh, and when they find out about that, when they find out that the work they're doing to protect their own backyards matters to the rest of the world, it's hugely motivating to them. And that of course is what we need. So in many ways, we're lucky to have uh, stumbled upon this issue and realized that they are quite willing to accept tech help and, uh, and great people to work with. So we owe them a great debt uh, of gratitude. We've, uh, we've done this, this sort of thing repeatedly across the world in many different places. Already in 14 countries, uh, you know, well over 3,000 square kilometers of forest on five continents. Um, what we're finding is that, of course, the problem is very different everywhere. Every conservation problem is, uh, is ultimately local. Uh, and of course, it relies upon local people and local partners to implement it. Um, but one of the most amazing things is how similar some of the solutions can be. And for every new project we've taken on, uh, we've learned things that we can then take elsewhere. Uh, lessons from Peru can be applied to Philippines. Uh, in many cases, you know, the actions of the rangers in Brazil uh, can, can actually help to impress upon people in Indonesia, um, you know, that they should also respond and take responsibility for it. But that's also just the work that's happening there on the ground to stop uh, the logging. What about the rest of us? What about the rest of the world? Well, every single one of these guardians that's put up in the uh, trees is able to stream audio in real time, more or less, up to the cloud. And that's pretty cool and useful as well. So in this case, we released an app that I hope you all will download that allows anybody around the world to listen in live uh, to, or also, you know, in the past to listen in to the live audio feeds from the forest. Um, it's not curated. It's not your normal kind of like rainforest peaceful sounds app. It's like up to the minute live. Uh, you'll hear really interesting and crazy things. You'll hear birds squawking. You'll hear, uh, you know, mystery animals walk through. It really is a, a sort of live connection to what's there. And this, of course, opens up new possibilities for us. If we really want to protect the forest, it's not just going to be about busting loggers. That's not an overall solution. It's an important thing to do now, but it's not an overall solution. We have to build new livelihoods and new ways to, uh, to make use of this data. And so again, it's not just about a live feed on the app. What can we do in terms of insights on that? So this, for example, is a feed coming out of Sumatra. This is a spectrogram. It's a way of visualizing the audio, a very important part of the work we do, as you've seen before. Um, but what if we were able to then start applying AI to pick out what's actually there? And then, of course, we can choose vehicles, if it's security. And so what you begin to see is this real sort of tapestry mosaic of the way in which this whole ecology is interacting with itself. And it's one thing to do this over the course of 30 seconds of audio. It's a whole other thing to do this 
with this level of precision up to the second over the course of minutes, hours, days, weeks, months, years, and begin to say and see the way in which uh, ecology and animals can actually change over time uh, and interact with each other over seasons, over effects from climate change. Uh, this is only possible with a platform like the one we built, which is processing in the cloud and an ability to add AI to it is pretty amazing. Um, so let's look at the way in which this can be kind of useful. Again, this here is only showing us uh, some animals. So let's look at Costa Rica, for example. This is kind of a brute force example. Um, so this is the uh, Osa Peninsula, uh, one of the most bio-intense places on earth. Uh, spider monkeys uh, are a really important species there. They're critically endangered, um, but they are also a really important vector for seed dispersal. Uh, and the forest it itself cannot regrow without these monkeys, this one species. Um, it's a really interesting keystone species in that way. Uh, they're also critically endangered and scientists study them. So we were able to build a detector to allow a scientist to track, uh, to track these monkeys uh, throughout the forest using the sound alone. But other interesting things came up as well. So um, in this case, we were able to see that uh, the monkeys can, can tell us what's happening in the forest. So in this case, there was actually an earthquake in Costa Rica. And this was, sorry, we were allergic to this because uh, the monkeys actually vocalize all day long. They're always making noise all day long. And yet one day at about 1130 at night, suddenly we started hearing lots of monkey calls. So we listened in and this is actually what we, what we heard. This is actually an earthquake. So see if you can listen uh, and hear the sound of these trees just shaking violently. And then the aftermath of that with the monkeys. really underscores how violently these trees shake with these guardians up there. And then of course these monkeys wake up and start yelling to each other like what, what was that? And this goes on for about 30 minutes. Now this was an example, a very brute force example of how nature can actually tell us things we would not have detected otherwise. Uh, in this case, the monkeys woke up and went a little crazy uh, with distress and, into, and you know, were able to show us that there was an event that occurred, whether it was a predator showing up, whether it was an earthquake that took place. That's pretty brute force. But you have to think about the rainforest, just as you saw from that spectrogram a few minutes ago, um, the extent to which everything in this, there's, a, there's sort of like a, a sort of medium, like a, a sort of a thickness to the sound that's there. Small changes from one species or the other can actually provide fluctuations. And it's only through looking at big data and like large scale analysis over time that we might be able to pick up, pick out the, the ways in which that changes based on certain, certain indices. Uh, what if a tiger walks through the forest? It's not gonna make noise. A jaguar is not gonna make noise, but you know the other animals are talking about them. What about a hunter, or a poacher going through the forest? These are all quiet things, but using these secondary indices uh, by doing this big data analysis, we should be able to eventually hear things that don't make noise simply by analyzing the fluctuations in the soundscape of the forest. That for us is one of the biggest goals, uh, not just for protection, but of course for science as well. Um, and this is, uh, these are interfaces that we really take seriously. In order to do this, we have to build these scientific interfaces to allow scientists to, uh, to use it. This is one of the ones that we, uh, we've released uh, recently uh, to allow them to sort of analyze uh, and, uh, and annotate data for each other. Uh, and of course, we're make, trying to make use of this platform for threat detection for larger purposes. Um, and it's not just about forests as well. So here's an example of a live audio stream from, uh, from some of our devices that are in Vancouver Bay in Canada. Um, there's a group there that wants to be able to track uh, orcas, killer whales, so that when boats go into Vancouver Bay uh, and orcas go in there, they were able to uh, sort of keep them apart from each other. So here's uh, the exact same analysis for whales, killer whales. Actually, this is a humpback, I think. Yeah, this is a humpback whale, also in Vancouver Bay, perhaps. So again, this exact same technology that of course was built for the purpose of uh, chainsaw detection now can be applied simply you know, by putting new AI models in there to lots of different things. But that's kind of the goal of this. We want to, uh, to really prove that the audio can be this powerful. I mean, when you think about the importance of sound, when you think about uh, what's available to us, I really believe uh, that the sound of our living planet might be the most, um, the most powerful untapped tool for protecting it. 
Uh, at the same time, by applying artificial intelligence, the ability to take these temporal large scale data sets and look at them with that level of precision at scale in ways that people never could. Um, you know, we, we hear from uh, some of our users that this could lead to a, an era of discovery as important as the invention of the microscope. Uh, the extent to which we were able to see, peer into worlds that we'd never sort of understood before. The same way that high energy physics is able to peer into beyond the microscopic, entirely different dimensions. Um, this is the type of thing that could be possible at the ecological sort of scale of things by looking at ways in which we were not uh, sort of evolved to, um, to pay attention. Uh, sound is not our primary sense, but you know, in the forest, you can't see more than 10, 15 feet in front of you. Entire ecosystems have evolved almost entirely based upon the transmission of sound. Uh, and so it's important for us to be able to use uh, technology and these techniques to pull out what those sort of sounds can tell us about nature itself. And through a platform like this, not only can we analyze it, but of course, you can save these uh, and create sort of an audio arc for the future. So again, this is the Guardian we put up in the field. This is actually an old version. Uh, and uh, you know, these are the areas where we uh, were protecting. We have partners all over the world. And then again, uh, more stories like what we saw there, being able to catch loggers around the world uh, back to protection. Um, in this case, they busted some loggers in Indonesia. But uh, you know, we'll be, of course, expanding into new regions. Uh, the amount of forest that protected, again, to mention 6,000 more square kilometers, the carbon impacts of that are just outrageous. We aren't responsible for these numbers. This is just the impact of protecting forests. But additionally, it's about the audio that we can, we can sort of amass, we can put into a platform, make available to scientists. Um, there is a whole science team Rainforest Connection now that's analyzing uh, these soundscapes to be able to, to help us understand what's there. Um, and so we really think that uh, the collecting this audio has inherent scientific value as well. And that's a goal of ours on top of it. And at the end of the day, even though this is what a device kind of looks like, uh, take out the solar panels, take out the box, take out the microphone. It's just an old cell phone, uh, an old smartphone. The sort of technological detritus that lies around us is incredibly powerful. Uh, and I hope that the rest of us can use it. And this is what sort of the future for us is to, is to implement less and less fancy technology and focus more on what we can do with what's already there. And that's kind of the goal of Rainforest Connection. Thanks a lot for your time. Help us out, it's awesome logging. Fantastic, fantastic. You touched on something close to my heart with the whales in uh, Vancouver Bay there. I'm a big whale fan, go all over the world uh, trying to spot them. And I think it's wonderful what you're doing. Absolutely wonderful. Thank you. It does Thank not you. surprise me that you have loads of questions. Okay. Um, so let's go over now to see an interesting one from Samuel. Do you encounter opposition from the locals who don't want you there? Oh, um, we only go to places where uh, we are specifically um, invited. So we, uh, you know, if I were to show up and try and tell some loggers to stop, I actually would have no right to do so, even if they're to leave, even if it's illegal. Uh, so we only go in places where uh, we are asked to come. Fortunately, because the word's out, um, we do get a lot of requests. Um, we also only go in places where we think we can be effective, which is, you know, uh, a pretty important filtering technique. Yeah. Um, so there's also Helena who asked, are the local authorities helpful in protecting the rainforest or do they sometimes just close their eyes due to the bribes from the illegal loggers? It is both. Uh, and oftentimes it's both in the same places. Um, I think it's really impressive. There are places where some of the, the authorities really do work hard. Um, and there's other places where the authorities, of course, are part of the problem. There's other places where the lines between organized crime and, uh, and you know, legal authority is very blurred, especially in some of these democratic regions. Um, but, you know, I have to say that we're seeing different different kinds. So in the Tembe territory, for example, they are law and order. Um, a breakdown in law and order there and every, everywhere uh, sort of leads to a just, uh, environmental destruction. Other places like the Philippines, which again is a much stronger uh, sort of law and order type, type territory, uh, the government of, is a very important partner in stopping it. Um, so there's no single answer to that question. Uh, but um, at the end of the day, we hope that by building livelihoods, by showing this is the best way to do it, and by showing that if people engage in this, they will get caught, uh, that that's the best way to sort of bring everyone on board. Yeah. Um, a different kind of question. Groups, big groups like World Wildlife Fund and Greenpeace must be interested in supporting you in your work, are they? Uh, we are good friends with these groups and they've always been supporting of us uh, all along. Um, we've been at this for quite a few years, but we're just getting started. We do have some large conservation partners and uh, the two that you mentioned, we have, have no projects with them yet, but uh, we share some board members and I'm sure we'll get into projects with them soon. I um, hope so, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, one question that came to my mind and I see someone's written it down also, where do you get the phone parts? Well, for a long time, uh, we had our 
on our website, you could get our address and send in phones. It turned out that people really took that very seriously and sent us lots and lots and lots of phones. Um, and you know, we still use we still use recycled phones. Every every guardian we put up to date uses a recycled phone. We are trying to move towards a different uh, kind of hardware that uses the same software but is not entirely based on old phones. So this is a kind of a next generation guardian uh, and new solar panels. Um, we'll always make use of recycled cell phones when we can, but we're um, you know we're trying to not fully rely upon that. Old phones are great. You got to recycle them, but I think it's better if we can make it allow people to use them where they are rather than sending them to us. Um, because everyone's got an old phone lying in your, you know, in your drawer somewhere. And if you could use that to do biomonitoring and study the ecosystems in your own backyard, yeah. that's probably even more useful than sending to us. Um, how many events alarms have you had? And have you experienced false alarms where some other sound was misidentified as a chainsaw? Uh, yeah, so there's definitely been many hundreds of situations where logging was detected. Um, I should really point out that a lot of the time it takes quite a few alerts and quite a bit of a support from us before uh, groups, even those that are intended to respond to them actually do. Responding to loggers is a really dangerous undertaking. Oftentimes, even though groups that say they want to or feel they want to stop loggers still need additional support when that actually comes about. Um, so that's the case. And as, as regard to false alarms, oh my, it's just constantly, huge, all, all the time. And you'd be surprised at some of the amazing things that, that sound like chainsaws. Um, a lot of things sound like chainsaws, especially for artificial intelligence. Uh, but luckily with the feedback from the people there, uh, they, they, are, they have an app called the Ranger app that's able to sort of reject. Um, they list basically when an alert comes in, they get it on their phone, they can listen in and say, oh, that's a chainsaw, it's not a chainsaw. That gives them more insight into what they're heading into. Um, and at the same time, that helps us to retrain AI as well. But yeah, uh, yeah. oh, there's some really bizarre species out there that uh, um, that was actually a question. Um, that is a very interesting one. Have you ever recorded one. some unknown sound which could be from some not yet discovered animal? Uh, we're actually working on this um, quite, quite a bit. So uh, basically there's so many crazy, when you listen to, especially the morning time or like the evening time, like that when the sun comes up, it's just this explosion of sound. When the sun goes down, it's an explosion of amphibious sound, like uh, amphibians. It sounds like a Star Wars laser battle half the time. I mean, there's so much going on in these places. And a lot of these, these areas are not fully um, explored scientifically. So now we do have a science team who's helping us to map these ecosystems. But also one of the things they're working on is can the big data technique allow us to pull out sounds that cannot be recognized and potentially seed uh, discoveries for new species. I am absolutely sure somewhat unempirically that uh, that we've recorded species that have not yet been cataloged but oh. I have no idea what they are or where they are and so we'll have to use AI to pick that out as well. Wow that is blowing my mind right now. Um, Carol is asking how can I support your project? How many people are in your team? Do you have enough resources for your amazing project? Uh, we have a really great team but no we by all means we're actually looking to expand it in a lot of ways on the science side on the tech side um, on the, you know, generally the administrative side. And we're also looking for ways by which we can send teams off into the forest to, uh, to install these and expand the project. Please do uh, reach out to us, contact at rfcx.org or tofer at rfcx.org, T-O-P-H-E-R. Um, we are expanding a team now. We'd love for you to be involved. Uh, and on the resource side of things, yeah, uh, we, I think we actually have a pretty good uh, model now where we can go after grants for certain things. Uh, people are very generous and donate and donate their money sometimes to keep things going. Um, but also one of the things we found is that we rely upon infrastructure of a lot of pretty great corporations uh, and a lot of pretty great organizations. So if you know a tech company, uh, if you know uh, any company uh, that would like to be involved in this work, uh, that we're actually able to leverage that into pretty good impact. So if you know anyone who'd like to, um, to see their technology used in pretty great ways and see it in the hands of people in the field, uh, please introduce them to us. That can go a long way. There we go, everybody. Um, there's an invitation. Um, here, a question from David, who says, hello from Panama. Oh, beautiful. Uh, are there other organizations from different countries that have had interest in developing this project in their forest? Uh, yeah, so uh, let's see. Um, well, bioacoustics, the study of sort of nature with sound is a pretty old field. Uh, we by no means can take responsibility for that. What we're trying to do is uh, streamline that and make it a lot more 
accessible to people. Um, the science team uh, has actually done a lot of work in Panama, just in bioacoustics, not so much in stopping logging. Um, and so we'll actually release some, some studies on that pretty soon that we'd love to share with you. Um, but yeah, so we do get requests from all over the world uh, for projects, whether it's from stopping logging or just studying the ecosystem. Um, but again, we're always open to new ones. And finally, we have the, um, we're able to sort of handle those requests. Uh, we'd love to work with you. We'd love to make you a part of what we do. So anyone who'd like to be involved, please reach out. And to that end, Rachel, who is the CERN Alumni Community Manager, which is quite a big platform um, at CERN, she says, CERN develops great data scientists. You're welcome to post yeah. your opportunities on our CERN Alumni Network. Please, uh, yeah. we, we'd like to. Us, we have the two platform, we'd love to put it out there yeah. uh, so that people can, can listen in and tell us what's going um, on. So, Interesting. Can these be used underwater to detect different sounds? Maybe you've already addressed that with the whales, but perhaps not. Yeah. I mean, so again, a uh, device like this, we're not, uh, we, we still haven't made this work underwater. But uh, again, this is just one piece of the puzzle. This is just the hardware. Uh, the way the system mostly works is in the cloud. So like what you saw with the whales in Vancouver was us, was us connecting an existing hydrophone up to our cloud. And of course, that took care of everything else up there. Um, and so we were able to work with lots of people that make uh, ocean oceanic hardware, uh, and then we can take care of everything from that point forward. Um, but yes, uh, bioacoustics, I say it's an old field, but that, that's like terrestrially on land, it's a, like it's old on, on wall in the water. It's like even older because as you know, uh, sound travels through water even better. Um, but yeah, uh, we would love to be able to support that. Uh, part of our mission is to protect forests, but we find ourselves uh, supporting um, scientists uh, on ocean research as well, including a project we have coming up in uh, with ORC in Ireland uh, to be able to track um, whales off the uh, west coast of Ireland. So we'll be able to talk about that pretty soon. So do they just, um, do, do these different uh, research projects learn about your work and just get in touch with you and, and, and Rainforest Connection and whatever organization, you just work together on how you're going to help them or, are you like speaking at certain conferences or are, are you out at some startup uh, events or how does it, how do these partnerships come about? Well, a lot of it came from, originally a lot of it came from speaking at events, nothing nothing quite as great as this one, but like speaking at events again, although Ted, TEDx CERN uh, in 2014 was the first sort of speaking event that I ever did. So thanks to you guys for that. Um, but, uh, but yeah, a lot of it now comes from sort of word of mouth projects working, passing it on. Uh, we're trying to get into publishing more papers about what works and what doesn't. Uh, that's, that's a really important way for us to be sort of um, much more deliberate about, uh, about speaking about what we do. Um, but additionally, we're finding that the, you know, the corporate partners that we have, uh, Huawei in China, Hitachi, Google, um, Microsoft, Nat Geo, all these ones actually go find us projects and match us up. And the good news then is that they get to see their technology be used in good ways. And if, they can even bring us partners whether it be governmental partners or like the one you see in Ireland. Um, we're usually not the ones to imagine which, uh, which partnerships we take on. Uh, we're able to just sort of take on the ones that were suggested to us. But, so again, we, yeah. Yeah, you must reach a point where, I don't know how big Rainforest Connection is. I follow you on Instagram. Um, I think it's still relatively um, a, a smallish team. You must be mm -hmm. reaching a point where you have to start saying no maybe to projects or, or are you being able to hire people fast enough to meet the demand? Well, we, we, are, we, do, we do take a lot on. Uh, there's a little more than 20 people on the team and then a whole bunch of awesome interns as well. So I guess about 30 people altogether that will obviously have to expand. But the good news about technology is that yes, we do, you know, we have to be involved in the development of it. But as long as we can manage the relationship with the partners from afar, we don't need to be there on the ground. In fact, it's better if we aren't. Uh, and so one of these big steps that we're trying to take this year is, is to not have to be involved on the ground at all and see what happens. Like, can we send this to somebody, have them put it up, even climbing trees, and then how effective can that be? These are questions that we have to answer uh, and publish on as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, back to the guardians themselves, a couple of questions on those. Francois is asking, do animals damage the guardians? Great question. So originally when it took a long time to build this thing up front and everyone in, you know, had these ideas like, oh, it's gonna get stolen, it's gonna get taken, orangutans are gonna come and tear it apart. Um, those are legitimate concerns, I guess. But if you spend a lot of time in the forest, you'll find that it's not like orangutans or monkeys or birds that rule the forest, it's insects, it's, uh, it's termites. And so 
we have yet to have a situation where a, a monkey is torn apart, but insects will just deconstruct everything. Um, so yes, when you're in the forest, you are constantly under attack by insects of all kinds. They are definitely in charge and, uh, and they've been known to deconstruct every, you know, everything that isn't like rigid plastic, they will like take apart. We've had guardians that have been entirely enveloped in, uh, in termite mounds. Um, it's really, they're really very creative, I gotta say. Uh, <laughs> and you're watching all of it. Well, I mean, kind of watching it from a distance, I guess. Yeah, listening, yeah. watching. Um, well, that's kind of cool. Is that eventually, these aren't just recording audio onto, a, onto an SD card, you know. Uh, they're like a real-time connection. In many ways, I think they're more, they're more like satellites than they are like, you know, recording devices because we we're stay connected to them. We're able to see what's happening there and getting out there to fix them is, you know, it's not as, it's not as difficult as getting into space, but it's, uh, it's about as, is, you know, still pretty hard. Um, Kuhn is asking how about detecting vibrations rather than sounds? It's a pretty good idea. Um, in many ways we are moving a little bit in that direction. When, vibrations, like there, there's actually some very effective technology uh, that's in play right now where it's, uh, it's like spikes that you drill into the ground uh, near roads and then the vibrations of, uh, of, of cars can be detected based on that. So that's actually a very useful tool in, in stopping illegal logging trucks. Um, we don't build that, uh, somebody else does. The trees move a lot. So just general vibrations uh, can, you know, don't necessarily make it to the top uh, in the right way. But uh, what we are getting into now is infrasound, uh, which is the ability for us to hear very, very low frequencies, uh, ones that humans can't hear because there are some really important um, species like elephants, Asian elephants and African elephants that, uh, that announce and communicate using infrasound uh, and avoiding human elephant conflict uh, is a really important thing. So being able to alert it, but being able to be alerted when an elephant is on its way into a farm um, can in many ways help the elephants from getting hurt, the people from getting hurt. Um, and so we're moving towards infrasound. Uh, Wow. That's about as close to vibrations as we're getting. Yes, as you're getting. Yeah, exactly. Um, I'm going to ask one final question, a very uh, simple one. Uh, how much material do you need to make a guardian? Uh, we're, we're, we're making them a little more fancy uh, these days. But uh, yeah, I mean, inside here, you can check it out. There's there's this kind of like central computer and Android compatible board battery. We got some, some uh, you know, this is sort of a reservoir for the solar panel so they can work 24 hours. There's a controller, microphone. You know, at the end of the day, um, I invite you to, we're gonna launch this new hardware in the, uh, at the end of this in this month. And so if, uh, if you'd like to a breakdown of the components, I'd be happy to give that on another call uh, or even uh, you can even order one and we'll send you one. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, Topher, thank you very, very much for that fascinating talk. It's still as fascinating to me as it was when I saw you first at the TEDx at CERN oh, thank you. a few years back. I'm really, really happy to see how you've grown and expanded. And um, I, I've got to admit you've really, um, you got my mind thinking about uh, the, the devices picking up sounds from animals that nobody's really discovered yet. That's just kind of blowing my mind a little bit there. I uh, hope, hope we can find out what they are. But again, that's, <laughs> that's with big data. It's, I mean, Sir invented big data. So thanks a lot for, for getting that, getting that all getting, getting that going. Uh, very, very exciting. So thank you very much again to Topher. Anybody who uh, wants to follow more about Topher um, and Rainforest Connection, there is the website Rainforest, no, RFCX, is that right? Mm -hmm. um, and then I also follow him on, uh, on Instagram and they post some great stuff. And uh, please do, everybody follow his work, support, and look, thank maybe so one of our audience will be coming in and working for you one day as well. I hope so, hope so soon. Please get in touch. Thank you. All the best for the future. Thank you, Topher. Thank you very much. Have a good day.